Welcome to Circuit 42. Circuit 42. The one-stop location for all things geek. This episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Dragon's Lair San Antonio and Gotham Newsstand. Sit back, relax, and most importantly, enjoy another episode of Circuit 42. Circuit 42. Hey everybody, and welcome to the newest episode of Circuit 42. I am here with special guest Tony Panaccio, and he is here to tell us about all the awesome things. Now remember, if you haven't heard of him, it means you're probably a bad person. Uh, or uh, that you're pretty much like everyone else. Uh, I, I'm one of those guys uh, that, that's uh, done a lot of stuff uh, for a lot of folks, uh, uh, but uh, I, I've been in and around the pop culture industry professionally for a very long time. been in the media for about 35 years. Uh, reporter, uh, marketing, public relations. I've uh, been a publicist for guys like Bill Shatner, Stanley. Uh, and probably for the folks that are listening, if uh, they are older than uh, than 15 or 16, they'll remember Cross Generation Comics, or as we later became known, Cross Gen Entertainment. Uh, and I was a senior VP at Cross Gen, uh, handling all of their film and television projects, uh, and uh, doing some marketing. And I worked with retailers, all of that. So, for those of you been following the Bleeding Cool uh, uh, report on another podcast that Mark Alessi did, yeah, uh, I was there. And then I've also worked with Michael Uslan, uh, the executive producer of the Batman franchise. Uh, I, I did uh, some marketing work with him, some consulting, and some film development with him. And uh, now I am working with uh, Wilson Media and uh, Lonesome Pine Pictures uh, as a consultant uh, and developing uh, not only uh, motion pictures with them, but also working on some branding for other motion pictures and other projects and other talents. Uh, most recently, I did some uh, PR work for uh, Big Stone Gap, which is uh, an indie film uh, with Patrick Wilson and Whoopi Goldberg and Ashley Judd. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm puttering around pop culture, uh, but uh, I, I've been around the block a few times and, and have seen a lot of weird caca. So, some of you have got to talk about right from the beginning, especially with, with the fact that a big part of our show is comic books. Mm -hmm. cross -gen. Crosstown is was one of those companies where it just seemed like they came out of nowhere. They produced so much talent, and then they were almost as gone, gone as quickly as they were there. And it doesn't, it never made sense to me as a comic book reader because it was before I started to get more involved in press. So I was not really keeping track of the background as a background as much as I was later on. So for those who don't know, let's talk a little bit about them and what happened. Well, a lot of people talk about cross-gen, and they talk about them in the past tense, and they talk about it as a failed experiment. Uh, and that's just not so. Uh, because at the time that cross-gen uh, uh, basically closed up and was sold to Disney at, uh, at Chapter uh, 13 auction, uh, the, the company had actually turned a profit. Uh, what happened had nothing to do with the comic books nothing to do with the film or television deals, nothing to do with the upward trajectory of the company itself. It had to do with uh, the liquidity of the owner, Mark Alessi. Uh, a little backstory. Uh, Mark Alessi uh, was, I mean, he basically was just like you and me. He was a guy who grew up on comics, uh, worked for a living. Uh, later in his life, he founded a technology company. Uh, called TRC, Technical Resource Connection. It uh, specialized in uh, object-oriented software, which uh, back in the 80s was a very, very big deal. Uh, and it was purchased in the late eight, in uh, the, the, the 90s uh, by a gentleman named Ross Perot. Oh, well, that, who, it was an interesting figure. Uh, history buffs. He ran for president as an independent candidate once. But he was a, he is, uh, he was a billionaire. Uh, and he was a technology billionaire. Perot Systems is one of the, the largest technology companies of the 90s and, and early 2000s. So uh, Mark Alessi sold his company to Perot for a lot of money. A lot of money. Uh, high eight figures, low nine figures. So when Mark retired, he thought, well, I have all this money. And he was a huge collector. He collected, he had a massive collection of Barry Smith uh, original artwork from Conan. Uh, he had uh, Dave Stevens 
complete, fully colored originals from one of his Betty Page uh, comics for Dark Horse. Uh, he had Frazetta's. Uh, he, he, had a, he had an amazing collection of artwork and comics. Uh, and he thought, well, hell, I'm still young. He, he, he was uh, only in his, uh, I think, either late 40s, early 50s. And he thought, I'm going to make a comic book company. And I think originally he thought it was just, it was just going to be a vanity thing for him. And he started, he, he used his money, he got this huge complex, 30,000 square feet. It was huge. Uh, and he put, a, you know, put showers in it, put a locker room in it, a massive kitchen, freezers, refrigerators. I mean, he, he had everything you could imagine. You could live there. If you worked there, you could literally live there. He had cots where you could take a, take a nap, a place for you to sleep, a place for you to shower, a uh, refrigerator stocked with food, a uh, refrigerator stocked with, with, with beer and wine, and uh, there was always a bottle of Crown Royal somewhere in the kitchen. So, uh, and, and as he started making these comics, he started to realize that, you know, he could make an impact. So he started expanding. And uh, he assembled a, a team. He had Ian Feller, who was uh, formerly with uh, Wizard Magazine. Uh, he got a, a guy who was really uh, grounded with the retailers, James Bright Beal. He pulled me in. I was doing, uh, at the time, I was actually Stan Lee's publicist. And he, he kind of pulled me into that fold uh, uh, from, uh, from Hill and Knowlton, which was the agency that I was repping Stan from. Uh, to do PR and marketing for him initially, and then I got more involved in film and, and television development. So he he did a he did a good job putting everything together, and his plan was to you know make a profit in five years, you know or not, you know as long as he had liquidity and interest and he wasn't dipping into principal, then you know what did it matter? He got to go to work at a comic book company every day. He got to hang out with creators he loved. You know, he, he went out initially hiring all the creators that he enjoyed. He hired Ron Mars and Barbara Kiesel, uh, Brandon Peterson. You know, these are some of his original hires. Yeah. Crossroom was just an interesting company because you had, like, this mix of, like, really, of just talented veterans a lot who I wasn't seeing in those places, and I was really happy to see them again. And then just, and then just bringing in, like, these new people who would just become huge. Well... One of the new people that we brought in was an art teacher from Nova Scotia. The first Comic-Con San Diego that we went to. And, you know, Mark never did anything small. We got a 40 by 40 booth at Comic-Con our first year. Yeah. I mean, nobody had a 40 by 40 booth unless you were... Uh, Marvel and DC had the biggest ones. I think there were 60 by 60 or something like that. You know, we, we had a, a pretty large booth for a publisher nobody had ever freaking heard of. But uh, this kid comes up, tall guy, uh, kind of beefy, uh, from Nova Scotia, Canada. He was an art teacher. He, he came to Comic-Con specifically to show his portfolio around to all the publishers. And DC didn't want him and Marvel didn't want him. And the thing about, that was different about CrossGen, now that people might remember, is we actually had an office where the artists and writers came in to work. You know, we only used freelancers for fill-in issues. But, uh, you know, outside of that, uh, everyone was in house. Yeah. So what happened was uh, we got this kid, and his name was Steve McNiffin. And Steve McNiffin uh, joined uh, the team, and he was an apprentice at first, and he worked with Bart Sears to develop uh, his, his technique and style. And then he did some fill in issues on Sigil, and uh, eventually he wound up as the lead penciler on Meridian. And Steve became one of these guys. To work at CrossGen, you have to understand what Mark did for teamwork. And there are a lot of things that Mark did that, that people can complain about and bitch about, and I'm sure that uh, you know, he, he's done a lot to make a lot of enemies uh, pretty much all around uh, pop culture. But he established these quads where you had a penciler and an inker and a colorist working in this three-tiered quad, what we called them, because there were four spaces. One, one space was kind of an open space where you could to, to walk around. And then the inker, the, 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 the penciler, and the colorist were all there together. And when the penciler finished a page, uh, he would go to the, the copier, 
make an eight and a half by 11 copy of it and hang it on the wall outside his desk. And then he'd give the page to the inker. The inker would scan, you know, would ink it. And then when he finished inking it, he'd make a photocopy of it, hang it on his wall, give it to the colorist. The colorist would scan it, color it, make a laser print of it, and hang it on his wall. So every day, because if you're doing a, a monthly book, you've got to do a page a day, period. Yeah. In fact, you actually have to be quicker than that because there's 22 pages in the comic and only 20 working days technically in a, in, in a week. But you know, we all wound up working seven-day weeks. We didn't care. We loved it. So these guys would come in, and they toil away, and every page would go up on the wall. And whenever Steve would put a page on his wall, people would gather around. It's like, oh, yeah, McNiven's got a new page out. Let's take a look. Uh, people loved They even waited for him to get his pages out. Uh, he was just developing so, so magnificently. Uh, so no one was surprised when, uh, when he was tapped to do uh, Civil War, and no one was surprised when when he started getting the accolades uh, that he deserved. But CrossGen was that, that uh, collegial atmosphere, and he got a lot of advice and a lot of tips and a lot of support from, from everyone around him. And for all the negatives that CrossGen generated, the teamwork that it engendered among the teams, just by sitting him in that quad and making him come to work every day, uh, I don't think anyone's ever matched it since. It, in many ways, it makes when you look at the people who worked with... Um... Crossgen, who started there, it reminds me of like stories that you'd hear from Caliber. We had the um, we had the head of Caliber of Caliber Press on there, and we're talking about like people like Bendis and Brew Baker and David Mack, and all these people were like giving them their first stories, and it almost seemed like Crossgen was that for the two thousands. I, I like to think that, that that we were, and and the artists and the writers, uh, the inkers, the colorists. Uh, you know, every colorist at CrossGen had uh, a, 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 a high-powered uh, Mac with a Wacom tablet. And some of these people would come in. Laura Martin was amazing to watch, but you couldn't watch her too long because she, she'd kind of get, you know, weirded out if she noticed people were watching her. <laughs> First thing I saw her work on was, was um, Authority with, uh, with Brian Hitch. Uh, Justin Ponzer uh, was also another guy who, who really came into his own uh, at CrossGen. But all the colorists, Rob Hunter, all, all the colorists, they just did stellar work. And I think that, that CrossGen, uh, a, as an imprint, helped to push coloring in the comics industry forward a little bit faster than it was moving. And even today, people are saying, you know, we should, you know colorists should get credit on the cover. Oh, God, yes. It's ridiculous that so they don't... Well, well, guess what? We were doing it way back then. Twelve years ago, we were doing it. Yeah. I mean, somebody like... That's that's the thing I liked about somebody like... Um, I, don't, I don't know how you pronounce the name, but Richard Eisenhoff, when uh, he started getting um, credit for stuff like Origin. Yeah. But, I mean, to, to kind of fast forward... Sorry. Uh, when, when we started getting... You know, well, my job was to get the press. Yeah. My job... And, and PR is, is more art than science, but the, the real mission behind public relations is to take an enterprise that's small and make it look three or four times its size. And we started with four titles, and then we grew to six and, and so forth over the course of time. But when we were still pretty tiny, we got some really good articles. We had a, an Associated Press piece. Uh, we, we got a placement in the New York Times. Uh, uh, I got a, a huge story in Ink Magazine about Mark and, and his, uh, uh, his plans for CrossGen. And the more media we got, the more media attention we got, the more it kind of buoyed you know, the, the spirit. And, and I think Mark kind of got a little bit of the jazz. And we started getting more and more press coverage. And so he, I think he kind of segued from this will be a nice kind of retirement gig, and I'll hang out and I'll have fun, and you know I'll spend a little bit of money, but this, you know, this is the way I want to spend my retirement. And it went to, no, 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 I'm on a mission. I want to change the industry now. And I think Mark really believed that he could change the industry and he could challenge DC and Marvel. And uh, and and we were battling it out. You know, we started as the 33rd largest uh, comic publisher 
And by the time that we hit uh, our, our, our pinnacle, we were battling it out between Dark Horse for third place. But what ended CrossGen had nothing to do with comics. Uh, Mark had been given advice by his, uh, by his broker and a guy that, that had helped him uh, grow his wealth over the course of time that he should take a margin position in Perot System stock because something big is going to happen at the quarterly report and he could really double down on, on his wealth if he took that margin position and bought that extra paper. Now keep in mind a lot of Mark's wealth was in Perot System stock because they paid him cash when they bought his company but they also paid him some in stock and options and, 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 and so forth. So he capitalized on that and something really big did happen uh, at the quarterly report. It lost 42% of its value in two days. Oh. The margin call all but wiped him out. Wow. That's... And, and at the time, he was funding an expansion of the company that would literally double the size of CrossGen. This was when we had like 16, 17 titles a month. He was going to double the size of the company to rival the output of, uh, of the big two. Because we were going to take over that third place spot resoundingly by doubling the size of our output. It's just uh, so frustrating hearing it now because, like, you know, I was reading Ruse, I was reading Route 666, I was reading all these really great books, and then, like, hearing this, you know, like this, it's just so... Well, you weren't the only one. It's heartbreaking. You weren't the only one reading those comics. Uh, Robert Zemeckis was reading those comics. Robert Zemeckis wanted to make films from uh, two of our comics. Uh, Wes Craven wanted to turn Mystic into a television series. You know, Larry Kasanoff uh, wanted uh, to, to do uh, a, a couple of films, actually. Uh, Chuck Russell and Frank Darabont uh, wanted uh, two of our properties. You know, Chuck Russell still actually has Way of the Rat. It's still an active property. That book was so good. That was like, for for me, I was so tired of, especially at the time, the whole DC, we're so dark, we're so gritty, Dan, beginning. I'm, I'm going to say something that might get me in trouble, but I don't, I don't think you'll listen to this. The beginning of Dan DiDio's Chain of Bullshit, where he tried to make... <laughs> Where it's like, I'm from a soap opera. I know how to do this. Let's put rape in the story. It's like, Dan and you, you're a fucking twit. And, um, and, um, Way of the Rat was the book that I was reading while I was ignoring everything going on over there. Because it was just such a fun comic book. Well, Chuck Dixon and Chuck Russell were working together on a script for the film. Now, Chuck Russell, about two years ago, did a, a massive deal with a, a Chinese film fund. Uh, the, the, to uh, fund uh, the better part of a slate of films. One of the films on the slate is called The Magic Scroll. And The Magic Scroll is actually Way of the Rat. They just changed the title, but it's the same property, the same, the same everything, and uh, they, they still retain the rights. They, they, they were able to, to work that out with Disney uh, when Disney took over uh, the properties. So that film is actually still in play, and it may or may not be made down the line. And a lot of Walking Dead fans might have CrossGen to thank because prior to looking at CrossGen's books, Frank Darabont was not interested at all in comic book properties. That changed. That changed a little bit, at least at the begin, at least of the first season. Yeah. Well, I mean, Frank Darabont was, you know, worked with Kirkman and really, you know, spearheaded. You know, if Frank Darabont wasn't behind it, I'm not sure AMC would have bought it. But he was. I mean, Shawshank Redemption, Green Mile. You know, the, here's a guy that, that has serious Hollywood creds and arguably has written the best script for an Indiana Jones movie uh, ever. Uh, they never produced it because Spielberg loved it, but Lucas hated it. But everyone you talk to in L.A. That will tell you the best Indiana Jones script was Frank Darabont's script for the fourth installment of the franchise. Um, I want to touch on something real quick before we move on. Um... Speaking of Darabont, like the thing that I, the movie I love, that I'm still introducing people to, because apparently no one saw it except me and twenty other people, uh, The uh, Mist. Yeah. And it's so funny showing that to people and saying, oh, and the the first thing I think, see hear from people is like, oh my god, Walking Dead is in this show. 
<laughs> well, you know, it's funny. You know, a lot of a lot of top filmmakers uh, uh, played around with the genre. Bob Zemeckis was probably one of the, the ones to play with it the most with films like The Frighteners, uh, and um, uh, oh, damn it! Now, now, now I'm uh, getting aphasia on the title. Uh, Describe it. I'm sorry. Uh, describe it. I'll probably know De- it right away. Death becomes her. Oh, dude, with uh, Bruce Willis in yeah. his least Bruce Willis role. That was like when Bruce Willis tried. It made me happy. Yeah, I think it's when Bruce Willis realized he was going bald. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we all knew he was going bald, but right about then he realized. I just thought of um, was it Animaniacs where mm-hmm. they have Bruce Willis and they they end up interrupting a Bruce Willis movie, and he says, "How's my hair?" and <laughs> And uh, Slappy Scrubs looks to him, what hair? And he looks all sad. <laughs> I love that even, like, when children's cartoons are like, yeah, you're going bald, bro, you might want to just go with it. <laughs> you know, we're living in, almost in the second generation of it because the people who are making movies today are, were the comic fans when we were all kids. Yep. Um, yeah. it, it was it, Spielberg. Uh, went on for about 20 minutes uh, when uh, they launched uh, the uh, Spider-Man ride at Universal way back when. Somewhere in my archives, I got like 20 minutes of, of, of Spielberg on video talking about um, the, the debt he owes to Stan Lee because Stan Lee helped teach him how to tell a story. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool, actually. Sorry. And not for, not for nothing, he also credited Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. And yeah. Don Peck. I mean, Spielberg knows all the old guys. He, he, he knows their work. Um, you know, one of the things that we used to do uh, at Comic-Con uh, with, with uh, guys like Uslan and, 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 and some of the other uh, uh, film guys, uh, you know, here, it's three in the morning, you're hammered, the bars are closing, uh, and everyone's bought some art. So you hold the art at 20 paces, and, and the other people have to identify who the penciler and inker are. <laughs> this just sounds fun. I would have loved to have been there for that. Silver Age covers at 20 paces. Go! What is it? Um, like, I remember I had... It was San Diego. I've only been to San Diego once. And it was the best experience I could have had. Because I'm walking down the middle of the aisle, and I see this like, short, kind of roundish guy with this big, giant, cartoony mustache. And anyone who anyone who has an idea of who I'm talking about gets it right away. I just look over to him, I say, You're Sergio Aragones! Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I am! How are yes. you? And then I, I say, I'm, I'm good! You drew my first comic book! Like, literally, I had it with me as the first comic book I'd ever bought as a kid. I was four. It was um, it was a uh, grew sixty six, I believe, and he said, "Oh, meet me over there. I'll si- I signed it for you." And I'm walking. And I said, oh, "Okay, I'll see you over there." I'm walking one step further. Neil Adams just on our right, just hanging out. And then um, the funny thing is with Neil, like I met him years later at another show, and we were just talking. And I thought, "Oh, you know, dude's not gonna remember me down the road." Another convention, like, eight months later, he sees me, and I have a copy of the first appearance of Havoc that I just got for free. Long story on that. Yeah. And I bring it over to him, and I told him, you know, I know you charge for your autographs. I just paid my rent. I this last, I don't really have any extra money right now. And it's a, either way, it's good to meet you. And he said, dude, I saw you eight months ago. I, I saw you at uh, Wizard World eight months ago. I'll sign it. I'll sign it. You can just pay me back. You know, it just see. tripped me out so much. You, you, you want to hear this? When I when I talk about the the the, the, the creators and, and and movie makers of today, uh, you know, relying on those kinds of encounters at conventions, really shape not just people's lives but the the entertainment that we see. Uh, there is a meeting. Uh, that uh, Michael Uslan had uh, with uh, Sam Raimi. And Michael had just gotten uh, a bunch of properties from Condé Nast. One of them was The Shadow. 
and he wanted to talk to Sam Raimi about doing a Shadow movie. Sam took the meeting, and uh, one of Michael's original jobs back before he was even in college, uh, he got a gig. Julius Schwartz gave him a gig when he, when, when, when he was very young, uh, writing some comics for DC. He wrote a couple issues of Batman, and then he wrote a string of issues of The Shadow, which was published in the early 70s. So Michael brought his Shadow comics, and he wanted to show them to Sam and see if Sam would be interested in turning that storyline that he wrote way back in the day into a film. So Michael's talking to him, and he's pitching, and he's talking, and, and uh, Michael's such a, a pitch artist that at, uh, uh, at NYU, uh, a guy who taught screenwriting there would bring Michael in, and, and he would uh, uh, he would act like a, a producer listening to other people's pitches. Their final exam was they had to pitch their movies to Michael. So uh, he's there, and he's doing his thing with Sam, and he keeps trying to get Sam to open the comics, and Sam won't open the comics. And finally, you know, Michael gets, you know, he, he hits a wall. He's like, Sam, will you just open the, will you just crack open the comics for a second and take a look at what I'm talking about? And he looks at him and says, do you think I don't know these comics? When I was eight years old, I went to a comic book convention and I had you sign these comics for me and you sat there and spent two hours with me while my mom was looking for me. That's so cool. Um, I I think yeah, you know, somebody at least with the first two Spider-Man movies, as anyone you know watching those, like you just know that Sam Raimi just completely engrossed in comic books. Yeah, it is one of the few things that we've contributed uh, to uh, culture around the world. Now we can't claim ownership to the comic book. We 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 can try. It's a tricky definition of terms. But uh, it's it's uh, it's an art form that, uh, that that we've really pioneered, and the masters. There's still some masters that are left out there. I would love to see more stuff from Len Wein. I'd love to see more stuff from Marv Wolfman. I'd love to see uh, Michelini. Uh, I mean, th there are guys out there who who aren't working, who should be working in the business. It's it's frustrating. Like we've had, so like. Um... Was it when we had um, David Michelini on the show? Mm -hmm. It was such like we, the sad thing is we haven't had, we didn't have a lot of viewers on that show, but I didn't really care because for me, I was talking to the man who, yeah, I was talking to the man who helped create Venom. I was talking to the man who created um, who wrote Demon in a Bottle, and mm -hmm. for me this was just amazing. And when I asked him, "Oh, what are you doing right now?" He said, "Oh, I wrote an intro for a book for Valiant," and it's like you should be writing the book for Valiant. Yeah, I didn't want to say that, but it's like, you should be the one writing that book you created, right, in the Future Force. And a lot of people don't realize it. Uh, back in 2006, uh, I produced a, a, a direct-to-video feature uh, for the Hero Initiative. Uh, it was called Evening with Stan Lee and Joe Quesada, hosted by Kevin Smith. Uh, we called it uh, uh, Marvel Then and Now. And uh, it's still available. You can get it on eBay. There, there, I think there's still some copies floating around. <coughs> Pardon. And Kev, one of the jokes that Kevin told when he was hosting this, uh, he looks at Sam and he says, and of course, you know, everyone wants to know about, uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, characters he ever created, uh, Wolverine. And about half the crowd at, uh, this was at UCLA, uh, in, uh, in Ackerman Hall at UCLA, about 1,000 people. Only about half the crowd laughed because only half the crowd knew that Stan didn't create Wolverine. Yeah, Len Wein Len, yeah. Wolverine. I was going to say Len Wein co-created uh, Wolverine. Yeah. Uh, Len Wein uh, co-created, John Romita did the original design, and Herbie, uh, Herb Trimpey uh, did the original, uh, the, the first appearance in, in Hulk. Uh, one, it was actually Hulk 180. Yeah, he had the cameo, and then he showed up in 181. Exactly. So, you know, the, the, but, you know, nobody knows that. And they should. Uh, but uh, it, most importantly, the people writing checks at studios need to know who who, who did what. Oh, uh, was it, it was really, I remember there was a huge controversy because while I actually really liked the Wolverine, especially the uncut version, I was, uh -huh. I, apparently I was not the only one upset that they took so much from Claremont's run 
and then did not give him a credit at all. And it's like, you were literally lifting from his storyline and just not bothering to give him a credit. And even he, he you know, Claire, Claremont's a classy guy, so even when he had an issue with them, he wasn't like, oh, I'm going to sue you. But um, it, it got to the point where apparently they're putting, they're giving him a story credit and involving him with the third movie because they realized they kind of screwed up. I'm wondering, did they, uh, he didn't get any credit at all? He didn't get any story credit for the Wolverine. And they took so much from his run, you know, it wasn't even subtle. Well, keep something in mind. When it comes to story credits, the studio has no say in that. Really? I didn't know that. No, no, no. The studio has no say in who receives a writing credit on, on, on a film. The Writers Guild of America is the one that decides. Every iteration of a film script is submitted to the WGA, and they keep a track of it. And they have evaluators that will go in, and when it's time to go ahead and do the, the credits for the film, uh, some film scripts will have as many as 40 writers on them. I mean, Joss Whedon did a very famous uncredited uh, scri uh, script polish on uh, the first X-Men movie. Yep. Um, and he put in the best line and he put in the worst line. He put in the, uh, you're a dick, and then he also put in the Toad Struck by Lightning line. Uh, except for one thing. That was a Brian Singer error. That was not a writer error. Okay, I've got to hear about this. Uh, when Joss Whedon wrote the line, it was a throw-off line. It was supposed to be delivered... Same thing as everything else. It was not supposed to be delivered the same thing as everything else. It wasn't supposed to be delivered like Shakespeare. It was supposed to be delivered like Seinfeld. And, but it then, was a joke. And then you've got um, oh, Halle Berry. You're such a pretty young. You're such a pretty woman. That's all I could say in regards to Halle Berry. I'm glad that she was barely in um, Days of Future Past. Yeah. Well. Uh, I think now, see, one of the things about the Writers Guild is, remember, uh, going back to the original, you know, going back to even 2013, um, it really wasn't practice for them to start giving credit to people who contributed to the comic book properties that some of the elements of the movie were, were pulling from. I mean, even, you know, The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises and Batman Begins, you know, borrow so much from Miller and Adams and O'Neill. They don't have writing credits. They don't have story credits. They got checks. <laughs> Another big one, especially with Dark Knight Rises, was I just started finally reading No Man's Land from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And there's so much taken from No Man's Land for Dark Knight Rises. Right. Well, th th there's uh, stuff taken from uh, The Dark Knight Returns. When uh, Batman's chasing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the villains on motorcycles through the tunnel, the first time he comes back in costume that he appears in public, he passes this cop car, and it stops, and, uh, and the, the veteran cop says to the young cop, oh, you're in for a show, kid. That's right out of The Dark Knight Returns. I need to reread it. It's been way too long. Like, I think I got so tired of the over because I love the book. Yeah. But I got so tired of the overexposure written media that I just sat at a sign that had it read it it's been like years. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, the the thing that I care most about is that guys getting checks. You know, guys like you know, uh, like Fabian and, and and Rob. You know, getting good checks for Deadpool. You know, but guys like Chuck Dixon, uh, guys like John Ostrander. Uh, uh, you know, John Ostrander who 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 you know practically created Suicide Squad. Yep. You know, uh, guys like that, uh, Tom Mandrake, uh, who, who did uh, the early art, you know, uh, Legends of Tomorrow is kind of like what DC Showcase was back in the 60s, because they're just pulling in characters from all over the place. And I, I, I think that the, one of the things that Paul Levitz did before he retired was he really got Warner Brothers out west to understand the relationships and to understand that, yeah, you need to pay these guys. You can't just, you know, you can't blow them off because the first thing 
that, and we did this cross gen too, but every comic book company does this. When a creator in Hollywood is interested in a project, what's the first thing that DC or Marvel or Top Cow or anybody does? They send them a stack of damn comics. Yep. Well, guess what? Some of those elements are going to wind up in the script. And while the intellectual property company owns that material, they still owe a debt to the guy who wrote it or the guy who drew it or the, or, or the, the person who designed it. Exactly. I remember I got to, um, like, one of my, like, normally with what, I, with what I've started doing over the years, it's become less and less common for me to just kind of completely fanboy at a convention. One mm-hmm. of the few times where I had to, I almost struck like a balance between professional and oh my god I'm geeking out completely. I got to hang out with um, just hang out and chat with Mike Zach, John Beatty, and Jim Shooter. Mm-hmm. And only then did I realize how because I had only just learned about how young Shooter was when he started working. Oh yeah, as the, as the editor in chief for Marvel, and we were just talking about the different stuff he'd done, and. I, when I, on one of my previous shows, I always heard about this reputation he has as, has as kind of a hard ass. And when I talked to him, like, I kind of see it, but he was so nice and so just cordial that I'm like, okay, maybe people came off to him as a certain way, and it was kind of the way he reacted to them. Well, you got to remember, you know, the, the people that you see at cons aren't the same guys. You know, Jim Shooter hasn't done a, a heck of a lot of work in comics. Uh, uh, in a long time, and, and quite frankly, the the Jim Shooter who you met was not the Jim Shooter who was the editor in chief at Marvel. Was not the Jim Shooter who uh, you know started writing comics for DC when he was a teenager. He was writing Legion of Superheroes. He was thirteen. He showed me the actual pages. Yeah, like he actually had them there, and it was crazy to see. Well, he's probably doing a panel talking about it. Yeah. But um, but people. People, they, they change, and, and, and their opinions change, and they mellow. I'm, I'm not even close to being the same guy I was at CrossGen. When I was at CrossGen, you know, there, 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 there's a goodly amount of time. I was just an asshole. You know, I didn't think I was back then, but I was. Uh, and then there are some things I did that I'm proud of and some things I'm not too proud of. But that's part of what happens when you, are, when you have life and uh, you grow old and you learn and you change. One of the transformative moments that I saw in the marriage of comics and movies actually took place in Chicago. I think it was 2008 or 2009 I was there with, with Michael. I was uh, 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 doing some panel discussions with him and managing uh, his book publicity because his autobiography had just come out, The Boy Who Loved Batman. And uh, we had a panel uh, about the Joker. And it was, uh, we had Steve Englehart on the phone. He was supposed to be there, but he wasn't there in person. Uh, we had uh, Jerry Robinson uh, before he passed away. Uh, we, we had a couple of psychologists from, I think it was univers- from UC Berkeley. I, I forget the exact college. Michael was on the panel, and a last-minute addition was Adam West. Wow. And the one thing that people didn't re- remember, maybe, from, uh, from 1989's Batman was Adam West did not have a cameo. Mm-mm. What a lot of people don't realize is he was supposed to have a cameo. Michael and Adam had talked about it, and they wanted him to play Batman's father in the flashback sequence. He was going to have that cameo in the original uh, 1989 Batman with Tim Burton. But then Adam's agent wanting a bigger payday, started making noise with the Hollywood trades about how dare they make a Batman movie and not cast Adam West as Batman. Despite the fact he's in his 50s and couldn't fit into the damn costume anymore, uh, you know, hell, they should, only Batman is Adam West. And this was against Adam's wishes. He didn't want him to do that. He went off the reservation. Warner Brothers had a cow and gave Michael the edict. There's no way Adam West is getting near this movie. And in fact, we're going to enjoin him from ever wearing the cape and cowl again at conventions. Uh, I, I, I remember that. That was so sad. That was Warner Brothers. That was not Michael. Yeah. So for 20 plus years, Adam and Michael didn't talk. And Adam did a lot of interviews were about the new Batman films. And, of course, you know, in 2009, you know, the Chris Nolan trilogy was coming out. And everyone was talking about Heath Ledger's Joker, which is why we had the panel on Joker to begin with. 
And we're looking at Cesar Romero's Joker and Jack Nicholson's Joker and Heath Ledger's Joker and Mark Hamill's Joker in uh, the cartoons. And uh, Adam had done some interviews disparaging it. It's like, oh, th th those are too dark and serious. Batman's always been a comic book to me. He should be fun. And then at the end of the panel, toward the end of the panel, after everyone had their say, and he listened to Jerry Robinson talk about the character and Michael talk about the character and the fans talk about and ask questions and the psychologists doing these serious pathologies on the Joker's psychosis. Adam leans over to the mic and he says, okay, guys, I get it. I get it. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it until today. Listening to you talk about this character with such passion and conviction and creativity, now I get it. I didn't understand it before, and, and, and I apologize. Um, I, I, I agree with what, what you're saying here today, and, and this was a marvelous character with a rich history, and I'm just glad to have been a part of it. And he and Michael made up that day right after the panel. So I, I have to ask something, because if you remember, he did the... Well, it's probably, in my opinion, the best Batman the Animated Series episode. Uh, the Beware Ghost. the Grey Ghost. Mm -hmm. Did he? Was that before or after this? Because that was before. We have to remember something. Uh, Batman animated number one. Michael does not have television rights to Batman. Yeah. Only film rights. So the only animated pictures that that uh, that Michael Uslan was executive producer of were the ones that were theatrically released. Oh, like in uh, Phantasm. Phantasm and Sub Zero. Yeah, the television ones he was not involved in, so there was no issue with Adam because the guy that that he focused his hatred on was not part of that team. Yeah, and uh, and certainly it's not like you know uh, at that point in time Adam had not really caught you know, caught back on in, in terms of pop culture, so it's not like he can turn down you know a check for walking into a studio and sitting for an hour in front of a microphone. That was that. That was like one of those for me. Um, like at my job, because I'm it's it's kind of fun to be the team leader of electronics sometimes. Because I decided, you know what, we're just gonna play all of Batman the animated series, and yeah. we just had it on the TV. And the funny thing is, it drew more people than any little demo movie that we've had on there. And the Great Ghost episode was playing, and it was a quiet day, and I'm watching it, and. There and there was this father and son watching too, who were in there, the department. And I just said that was. And I just looked. We we were there the whole time. We watched the whole episode. And I just looked at him and he said that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? And he said, Yeah, yeah, it really was. And just you know, the little boy probably didn't get it. Yeah, you know, he probably thought, Oh, mystery adventure show. But you know, me and the dad were sitting there watching this, and just how. You know, just how incredibly well done that was. How beautifully done that was. You know, let me tell you something. Pound for pound, the work that, that, that Warners and DC ha, ha, has done with the animated versions of their characters stands up against anything they've done in live action and in some cases exceeds it. Yeah. Um, my, 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 my thing against Batman v Superman was that it wasn't fun. And if you go back to what Dwayne McDuffie accomplished with Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, some of the stories were serious. Yeah, it was animated, but it was fun. Oh, yeah. It's fun. It, not necessarily funny. It's not like it wasn't laugh a minute, but it was fun. And I hope that Warners learns from its mistake with BVS, and when they go to the Justice League movies, they look at what Dwayne McDuffie accomplished with the animated series and maybe pull a few notes from that. His, his passing, you know, when... It just, it just hurts so much. It yeah. did. It had a ripple effect, and we, and we really lost a major talent. And the the thing that really hurts is when you look around. I'm not sure there's really been anyone to step into those shoes. I think the closest would be with you know with with um, Bruce Tim finally returning. Yeah. You know. And but now we're going to see what what he's able to accomplish with uh, the Killing Joke. I cannot wait. It's going to be amazing. I thought it was really interesting what he said recently that they could have easily done that movie, the PG-13, and just maintained everything because of how lenient they've been with the DC animated universe. I mean, look at 
like under the red hood. Uh, one of my, I had to tell one of my team members, no, let's not put on under the red hood. They said, oh, it's PG thirteen. Puts it on, starts with Jason Todd being killed, and it's like, yeah, we're not putting that on. Yeah, because <laughs> it's darker than any of the live action movies, and somehow it's PG thirteen. And, and the thing, the thing is interesting is. Um... Hollywood likes to copy. You know, one one of the things that I learned when I was a cross gen, and it, and it was a good lesson, was that, and it, one of the reasons why I'm not really talking about any of the film projects I'm working on right now, yeah, is containment. Uh, we uh, we are working on a film project, uh, ba- you know, based on negation. Uh, and I forget who it was who announced it. I don't know if it was uh, Dark Woods, which was Frank Darabont and Chuck Russell's company, or if it was someone else we were working with. But somebody uh, let Chris Marlowe at The Hollywood Reporter know that they were working on a negation film with CrossGen. And that was about a, you know an alien prison. A week later, Dean Devlin announces that uh, he now has his new film in development called... Wait for it. Alien Prison! The, God, the, I, I am going to bite my tongue, because there are so many things I can say about Dean Devlin and the work he produces. Yeah, well, but, but the thing is, I don't think Killing Joke being rated R has anything to do with anything except Deadpool. Yeah, I, I agree, because literally that movie, like Bruce Tim said, could be done on a PG-13 with all the same content. Because yes. they're so lenient towards the animated films. Well, I think also they want the headline, and they want the people who went to see Deadpool. But they, but again, you know, a lot of the Hollywood marketing folks. It's funny. I, I can say that that one of the, one of the people I consult for uh, and do some brand work for, as of today, actually, is uh, is a, an amazing talent, Adriana Trigiani, uh, who uh, uh, was the writer uh, and director on uh, the most recent uh, uh, film, Big Stone Gap, hmm. uh, that Patrick Wilson was in. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one of the things about, uh, about branding in Hollywood is that most of the folks in Hollywood, and, and, and I'm sure I'll take shit for this uh, if anybody listens to it, they don't have a damn clue what they're doing. There is zero correlation between the Killing Joke animated film and Deadpool. None whatsoever. They're, they're completely different properties, completely different tones, completely different audiences. Yes, they're both from the comics. But studios are now making the same mistake today in reverse that they were making back in the 70s when uh, guys like Michael were pitching comic book movies and studio producers are saying, oh, well, Batman won't work on mo- in, in a movie because Annie didn't work. Well, they're both from the comics, right? And you know the worst part is? It's starting to remind me of comic books in the 90s. Where it's like, hey, we need our edginess because Deadpool had edginess and people like edginess. And it's like, no, 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 the comic industry is looking at you like you're insane. Because we saw it happen. And the knock on Deadpool was that he originally was just a a ripoff of Deathstroke. Yeah, it's, well, it's it's kind of nice. We've talked to Fabian, we've talked to people, and he's, it's like, some people will tell you he's a parody, some people will tell you he's a ripoff. But he's definitely not an original character. No. But... You know, it's all in the execution. Yep. Is, I mean, is, is the the Superman that's played by Henry Cavill now the Superman that was played by Chris Reeve? Or even Brandon Routh? Yeah, or, okay, Dean Cain was really silly. <laughs> ah, it was I, Superman in a rom-com. Yeah, and I gotta say, like, he he pulled off the look. Like, I like, that's the thing about any of the actors who played Superman is that, for the most part, they've all pulled off... They've always cast people who actually pull off the look of Superman instead of just some random dude. Well, like, you know something? You invoked Dean Kane, so we're going to continue this random access memory uh, stream of consciousness conversation. Hell yeah. Dean Kane, Helen Slater, John Wesley Shipp... Uh, I mean, th- these are actors uh, who portrayed uh, uh, Superman, Supergirl, and Flash in the 80s and 90s, and now they're in CW shows. Yep. Okay? And they're pulling all of these great cameos out. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Paul Rubens uh, is playing the Penguin's dad. <laughs> that, I was so excited about that because, like, yeah. it's like he's back. He's back to Batman. Well, 
you know, he originally played the Penguin's dad in Batman Returns. Yep, yep. I remember that. So, yeah. Sorry, you got me like, so, that so was here's my bitch. childhood. Here's my bitch. It's time for a fucking Adam West cameo. Yes. Give him a great ghost. Get, Seriously. Just l- give him two seconds on screen as a passerby. I mean, hell. I mean, how could it be any worse than Stan Lee as a strip club DJ? Yeah. Uh. Give him two seconds on screen. Acknowledge the fact that there are people who loved what he did. I, want, I would love to see him in Gotham. I, I really would. That would be so cool and it would work so well. I, I think it would be wonderful. Yeah. You know, but but if you're not going to put him in a Batman movie, fuck it, put him somewhere. Stick him, in, put him on the Flash, put him on uh, Supergirl. I mean, all these other people are getting love. And you know, Adam West was the first guy. He was the first damn guy to climb in costume in prime time. Yeah, him and Green Hornet. You know, and now, now Superman originally, you know, George Reeves oh, you yeah, know, was the first of the first. Uh, but that was back when, you know, comics didn't have, you know, uh, an older audience. They were cheap, disposable entertainment for kids. In the 60s, things were getting funky. Yep. You had Green Arrow, Green, Lan- you know, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Things were starting to get more contemporary. And this was a Batman made for adults, not for kids. And then Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams really launched that, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of maturity for characters like... Um, Green Arrow, Green Lantern, Batman, and despite, you know, despite the controversy of it, the funny thing is most of the people I know who got upset about the Wonder Woman book that he did, that Neil Adams did, that Daniel Neal did, never actually read it, and even though I can understand why it upset people, it was still a good comic book. You know, that... It, there is amazing work that was done back then, and... Uh, I think the production values today are so slick and, and, and so strong. Look at the Eisners. You know, the people that are getting nominated for Eisners today, you know, even going back 10, 10 years ago, uh, you had your Drawn and Quarterlies and, and you had your Evan Dorkins and you had, you had those guys, uh, but it was still dominated very much by, by DC Marvel, DC Marvel Image, uh, you know, superhero science fiction type stuff. Today, the genres and subject matter that are, that's represented, and the talent that's represented from every—I mean, you're not getting more diverse. I mean, we we I I have a I have a a friend on uh, uh, Reggie Hudlin. Uh, who is a film director and, and producer yeah, from in the House Party movies. He did Boomerang with Eddie Murphy, and he just recently produced the Oscars telecast. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, the, the knock with the, the, you know, with the Oscars so white hashtag, uh, because there's no diversity in the nominees. You don't get more diverse nominees in, in creative arts than the Eisner Award nominees. Yep. And I think that's something the industry should be proud of. But it's not just that they're being nominated. It's the, the, the amazing range of content that's being produced. Comics are better today than, than they've been uh, in a very, very long time. Uh, but I think we still need more diverse creators. I think, that, uh, I think the big two need to think more. And it's not just about, oh, quotas or hiring more black women or more Latino women or more Latino men. It's about perspective. It's about culture, and uh, you know I, I I cannot claim any superior knowledge to what it's like to to grow up in a big city because uh, uh, I grew up as a reasonably privileged white male. I don't have a frame of reference to tell a dark, gritty street story because I didn't live it. I can read about it, I can research it, I can parrot what I've read in other comic books and other novels, but it's not coming from my heart. We need people with diverse cultures, not for the colors of their skin or their ethnicities, but for the cultural experience that they have, that they can share with a, with a broader audience through comics, film, and television. Well, I, I, are you familiar with the work of Andrew Vox? I'm not. I'm, I, I am ignorant in that regard. Um, he did a comic book called Cross. <gasps> oh, uh, 
Wait, the cross with, um, is that the one that Garth Ennis worked on as well, or is that a different one? Different one. Okay. Uh, it was an indie, uh, I, I, don't, I can't remember if it was Eclipse or First, but it goes back to the 80s and 90s. It was about a mercenary with another team of mercenaries, and they weren't good-hearted mercenaries. They were pretty mean, nasty sons of bitches. Uh, but every so often, they came across an injustice that they would correct. But they'd usually do it only if there was a big payoff involved. Well, uh, Vox was also, uh, in real life, uh, Vox wasn't necessarily a mercenary, but he was a guy that would go to these uh, child labor camps and, and child sex slave camps uh, where, where in, in, in Indonesia and the Philippines, and he would help uh, uh, villagers raid the camps and free the kids. White slavery and child slavery, he's gone around the globe fighting it, oh, literally wow. fighting it. The guy wears an eye patch, and I'm not quite sure where he lost the eye, but I don't think he lost it writing it, you know? Uh, so, you know, so his experience obviously played into this, and he wrote a two-issue Batman arc that uh, was done for charity for one of these children's charities about the child sex trade. Uh, and of course, inserted Batman into the story and having him, you know, break up one of these rings. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's his experience. Well, why? You know, his experience is valuable. Well, why isn't a Latino male who who grew up in the Chicago slums? Why is his perspective not valid? What about uh, an African American girl who grew up being bullied uh, uh, her, her entire life because uh, she lived in the wrong neighborhood? You know, how about her experience? What about her perspective? It's not about anything else other than getting more voices, diverse voices in the entertainment business. Because there, there, there are millions of stories out there to be told. Millions. But we can't all be white male writers and, and think that we have the perspective to tell them all. Exactly. And like like you're saying, that's the one thing really missing is is that, and you, we don't see it anymore. And the worst time, like you said, this is the best time for comics, and that's the one thing that makes it even better. Yeah. Well, I mean, we all have our different work experiences. I was a journalist for ten years, so every time I see reporters and journalists characterized in comic books and film, I just roll my eyes. Wait, you mean you're not actually Ben Urich? Uh, I was a crime beat reporter. I did, uh, I, I worked, uh, uh, beside cops who were doing undercover drug stings. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been in a safe van while they're making arrests. And I, I did watch Ted Bundy die in the electric chair. I talked to his, some of uh, the families of his victims. Uh, I talked to the cops who arrested him. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that, you know, when I see journalists depicted uh, in comics and in television, and, and my God, certainly in the Zack Snyder movies, somebody needs to hit Zack Snyder upside the head with a frying pan because he doesn't have a, a, a damn clue how a newspaper is run. The whole, the, dude, the part where the cop were just randomly shooting, and like the young cop just like shooting a shotgun off in the middle of the building, it's like, what the hell? What cop would ever do that? This, you're not Dick Cheney. You're a police officer. Stop yeah. actually shooting your co-worker. Yeah, it's... But, I mean, news outlets don't work the way that they're depicted uh, in, in any of the comic films that, that, that I've been watching. <laughs> and I don't think they've ever been depicted correctly. There was but, a... Um, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, you know, because the most common one for comic book fans, of course, is J. Jonah Jameson, Daily Beagle. There was one... I was flipping through some old comic books of mine, some old silver I was showing them to my girlfriend, because she's starting to get into comic books. And there's a scene where this po this politician, he's this corrupt politician, realizes he screwed up, and tries to contact Jameson to give him some positive spin. And he tells him, "Yeah, you're a, yeah, you're a monster." 
I'm not doing this for you. Because I, I run a newspaper. I have, hey, he basically tells him, you know, I have ethics. And I'm not putting this out. And I thought it was like, it was just a cool moment that you don't see at all with J. Jonah Jameson. Because every other time it's like, get me pictures of Spider-Man. And it was so cool seeing him actually run a newspaper. Well, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the publisher of a newspaper rarely has anything to do with the actual editorial content. The job of the publisher is to sell as much space in advertising as humanly possible. The publisher is in charge of revenue. Well, wasn't he the editor in chief of the book? If I remember, I always thought he was the head. I always thought he was the head editor of the paper. Uh, in the early days, he was editor in chief, uh, and then they introduced uh, Joseph Robertson as city editor. Yeah, this and, was, this and, one was from like early seventies. Yeah, and then by by the late seventies, they had elevated uh, Jameson to publisher, and Robbie was now the editor in chief. Editor in chief yeah. makes all the calls, and there are a couple of issues. And I want to say it was Jerry Conway who wrote them, uh, where there was the, the, the clear delineation where Robbie would go to Jonah and say, Jonah, I'm the editor-in-chief. You don't have any say. You're the publisher. You don't get to tell me what to do here. <laughs> and, 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 and as a kid, I remember reading that. And then when I grew up and, and I was actually working in professional journalism, I said, oh, my God, Jerry Conway got it right. And not for nothing, Conway had a hell of a career in television. That that makes sense now. It's, um, I I had no idea about that. Well, you know, Conway you know went on to after he left comics, right? Mm -mm. He was a writer and executive producer on a little TV series called Law and Order. Dude, Cause see, because I was like, whatever happened to Jerry Conway? Because I'd seen books by him, and yeah, you know, especially when you're a kid, you don't even think about. Who makes this TV show? You just think about the show. And I had no idea about that. It's interesting. Uh, people are starting to, to – consumers are, are getting into, you know, who's directing this movie, who's producing that movie. More than ever before, when Zack Snyder was announced as the director of Man of Steel, it trended number one on Yahoo for two days. Wow. And that's when I first started to realize people are getting into this. They're getting into, into watching credits. You know, my, my my big rant now that, that I'm doing films uh, uh, more professionally is, you know, do you, do you need 90 executive producers? Really? Or how about when you have seven writers and it's like Transformers 2? Like seven people apparently couldn't make that movie work. Well, seven writers is, is what the Writers Guild said. Okay, based on the, the drafts that we've seen and evaluated, these seven writers get credits. There are probably 20 writers on it. Which is insane, because that is objectively one of the worst movies of all time. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny, I, I told that to somebody, and they said, oh, what about The Room? And I said, The Room had a $10 million budget, and it was directed by an insane person. Mm -hmm. This was a $200 million budget, directed by someone who, despite his lack of skill, had experience, has had experience working in film. And he made a movie that was objectively just as terrible, just for different reasons. But but let's let's be clear though the the, the role between writers and producers, uh, you're getting into a lot more films where where writers are producing or producers are writing, or and vice versa. Yeah. And it's because you have a guy like Akiva Goldsman. Now Akiva Goldsman won the Oscar for best adapted screenplay for A Beautiful Mind. And only about six or seven years before that, he wrote Batman and Robin. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, what is the X factor that can take a guy that writes that kind of dreck, and, and then he's also capable of writing this amazing, beautiful, almost poetry of a movie? Well, it comes back to producers, I think. Uh, Warner Brothers uh, still, still, even, even the age of Kevin Tushihara, cannot seem to get out of their own damn way. Uh, the only thing that they did right, and this was more Alan Horn than Kevin Tushihara, was uh, letting Chris Nolan do whatever the hell he wanted with Batman. Yeah. And the studio didn't really you know, throw a lot of notes at him. Um, but when Joel Schumacher had taken over the franchise from Tim Burton, 
oh man, the studio, they had requirements for him. Okay, Joel, in this movie we need three costume changes, three vehicles, and three villains, uh, and uh, you're going to use Batgirl this time, and uh, let's, you know, we're going to use Robin too, and uh, let's do something else with Alfred, and, and let, let, I mean, they, they had to have a boat, uh, a motorbike, and a Batmobile. When you when you listen to the commentary, like you, you like you, you probably have a closer experience than I do. But when you know, listen to the commentary, I felt legit pity for him. Like it's like, oh my god, it's insane. Like when you listen to him talk about the stuff that he was actually allowed to do, mm-hmm. like hiring uh, John, like hiring like John Glover, and when he talks about his knowledge regarding Batman the animated series and elements of the comics, how you want to make your one. It's like, oh my God, you have someone who could have made a perfect movie if you just left him alone. Yeah. And incidentally, the thing that Mar- that Warner's is doing wrong, Marvel's doing right. I mean, look at the talent that they're hiring. It's not like they're going uh, to the same well all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, Scott Derrickson. You know, he's not an Oscar-winning producer or director. He did horror movies. Uh, and they thought, hmm, here's a guy with the right tone. Let's talk to him and, and you know, see, you know, uh, what you know what kind of take he'll have on, on this. And they did. Um, and that movie looks amazing. Like, just that teaser alone, it looks so, it looks so different from what they've done. But it maintains, it seems, it maintains, it looks as if it's going to maintain the qualities of all the previous movies while being something very different. Well, they're, they're pulling also new writers in. Uh, the writer of the screenplay is a gentleman named C. Robert Cargill. Do you know the other name he goes by? I do not. Massaworm, one of Harry Knowles' top reporters for Ain't It Cool News. Oh, wow. That's really cool, actually. You know, they're pulling these people in uh, from, from, from different places, and they're, and they're trying to match the right talent with the right people. And, I mean, uh, Cargill uh, was a Doctor Strange fan from way back, but he, you know, they, ha- he, they picked him out of nowhere because he had the right talent and the right take and the right tone. I remembered him from uh, Spill, uh, for, for a co-host of mine, recommended Spill.com. Mm-hmm. And it was such a it's such a great show, and I'm so glad that despite all the controversy that happened with Hollywood.com, that's still going. Yeah. And um, I remember they were talking about him being involved, and them saying, "Yeah, he's making a movie," and it's like, "Holy crap, that's pretty cool." Well, Marvel is hiring creators, and by and large, letting them create. Ke- Kevin Feige is doing what he does, and I think he he reins them in when when necessary. Uh, I think we saw that happen with Ant Man. Oh, that when Edgar Wright was going a little bit too far off the reservation. Yeah, I, I love Edgar Wright though. I would I I like I love the what they did with Ant Man, but I would genuinely I wish I could go back and see what a, 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 a pure Edgar Wright Ant Man could have been. I, I, I think a lot of people think that. Uh but I mean at the end of the day, you know, if you look at the comics, every comic has an editor. And every group of comics has the group editor. I think, by and large, they're overmanaged. But back in the day, Stan Lee was the editor for all of the Marvel comics before he started hiring Marv Wolfman and Roy Thomas to pick up some of the load. And he needed to be because he needed to keep track of, okay, where's Thor this month? Where, <laughs> what's going on in this book? What's going on in that book? Uh, you know, we, we're moving in a certain direction. And I think you need that kind of oversight. And I think Kevin, Kevin's holding the leash, but he's not holding it with an iron grip. He's he's got a lot of slack on it. Yeah, it's so funny. Like listening to this reminds me. Um, we did a we did a show called the '90s Show, where I was so, I was always kind of upset about the blanket that people throw over '90s comic books. A lot of them having not read them, and just say, oh, they're all big tits, big guns, and explosions. It's like they were to a point. Certain companies were, but then, like, I remember I told somebody, go to, look up some DC stuff from the late 90s. Like, Devin Grayson on Titans, and yeah. Grant Morrison on JLA. And there were some really good books. But it was interesting talking to her, 
Because she said while she loved working for them. Because we had her and we had Scott Lobdell on and we had Dan Fraga. Uh And Lobdell talked about how they had a meeting and they said, oh, give us a... Does anyone have any ideas for a, for a, any ideas for books coming up? And Scott LaBelle just said, uh, Onslaught. I said, okay, cool, let's do that, Onslaught. They asked him later on, so what's Onslaught? I don't know, I just said Onslaught. <laughs> and uh, and I just, I love that story. And, like, Scott kind of stole that show because he was just being a snarky, he was just being snarky Scott the whole time. But um, then we heard about Devin Grayson talk about DC. And she said it was a bunch of creators just creating. But she said the band, the one big problem with the company was that everybody held onto their characters so tightly that be doing big crossovers like the Texas Imperative were absurdly oh. difficult to do because you have one, peop- one group was like, no, you can't use my character, I'm using this character. Or like, you can't use this character, you can't use Batman. And one of the people just came down and said, what are you people doing? Stop it. Stop it. We're making this story. Stop freaking fighting about your characters. And, and it's it really comes down to editorial leadership. And that, that's not to say that you need a strong editor who's going to uh, you know, wrangle everyone and, and make sure everyone stays on the reservation. Yeah. But actual editorial leadership, where you can get along with the writers, get along with the creators... And work with them as opposed to have them work for you. And there are some some editors at at DC and and, and some at Marvel over the course of the years who had that reputation. Uh, You know, guys like Archie Goodwin. Everybody loved Archie Goodwin. He was a good writer. Uh, He wrote some of the best uh, Manhunter stories that DC ever published. Uh, But he was a a well-loved editor at Marvel. Everybody loved working with him. Uh, Mark Grunewald, again, you know, a, a guy that everyone felt was the salt of the earth, and, and boy, did he love Captain America. Yeah, his, his Captain was so cool. I mean, I as a kid, my, my, along with my Gru comic, the first Captain America comic, first comic, I, Marvel comic, like superhero comic I got, was the first part of that Whitley, um, that two-parter where, where Ronald Reagan's a snake. <laughs> and I'm wondering, huh, I wonder if Grunewald sneaks into politics in here a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. This is, yeah, this is pretty subtle. It's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the, I, I think right now DC is floundering because they keep trying to keep trying to find a new formula. Uh, and uh, the the formula is just tell a damn good story. Tell a good story. It, it hasn't changed. If you look at the comics that get recognized uh, critically and in terms of sales, they're just telling good stories. It has nothing to do with a gimmick or continuity or, oh, Sam Wilson's Captain America this week. Oh, Steve Rogers is old. They've never done that before. Grunewald did that before, actually. Grunewald did that in the 90s. In fact, uh, they, 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 <laughs> they, had, they had a fight between the, the aged Captain America and the aged Red Skull. <laughs> it was like geriatric wrestling. <laughs> so, oh, Steve Rogers is old, like it's a new thing. No, they did that before. Now Sam Wilson's Captain America. Oh, now we have another Captain America. You know, Pretty soon we're going to have like three or four Captain Americas. And nobody gives a damn until someone tells a really good story and somebody says, hey, did you read that last issue of Captain America? Hold on, we have to turn him into a wolf. No one's ever done that. (laughs) I love that. I don't know if you saw it. They did a a recent Captain America figure for the Marvel Legends line. Mm -hmm. And they did something that I thought was beautiful and most people didn't understand because they gave him the wolf cap head as a variant head where you could detach the regular head and put the cap wolf head on. And it's like someone at Marvel has a really, really awesome sense of humor. No. I I, I think uh I, I think comics need to be fun. Yep. Uh I I, I think that uh Warner needs to start 
And, and even the way they're approaching Suicide Squad. Okay, the knock on BVS is that it wasn't fun. There was no humor. There were no jokes. But it was kind of soulless because there wasn't. You know, it just wasn't a fun place to be. It was a spectacle. It, 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 it was something to follow. It, it, there was a lot of action. It was, it was a movie movie. It was a popcorn movie. But it wasn't fun. And I think DC and, and Warner's is trying so hard to be not Marvel that they're not marveling themselves into uh, bad movies. You know... Um, um... I, got, I just wanted to say that I think as an outside influence who's probably helping out a lot, uh, Gerard Way. Um, you know, if you know, do you know Gerard Way? No, I don't. Um, he was from the band My Chemical Romance, and he started off as a comic book creator. And apparently it was um, uh, during 9-11, he was actually working on a comic, like an independent comic that he was doing. And he said that he really liked working on the comic, but... Seeing that and seeing, you know, so many people die and such a horrible thing happen, that made him realize that he would, that he needed to pursue what he really wanted to do. Uh-huh. And that's how he created his band. But later on, uh, apparently he had, he had met with Grant Morrison and they had become friends. And he did a comic called The Umbrella Academy, which won three, four Eisner Awards mm-hmm. that year. And then he did a follow-up to it. And now... Then he did a work on Spider-Man, where he took, where he created this um, kind of manga-esque cyberpunk take on Spider-Man, where it's a female female version, who actually creates this like robotic mech suit, and is like this hard, this far future version of Spider-Man, and now he's doing what DC should have done a long time ago, and he's basically fixing Vertigo. But like, he's he's taking over for a lot of their. As a as like an editor, and we're doing stuff like bringing back Animal Man, and all these other books that they just didn't know what to do with, because mm-hmm. they didn't have anyone who understood these books. Because yeah. Bob Harris does not understand Animal Man. Oh. I mean, Animal Man has such a long sorted history uh, w- with so many different versions, and he's dead, and he's alive, and he's dead, and he's an avatar, and he's a spirit, and now he's magical, but now he's not magical. He was he just he's all over the map. And every new writer, after Grant Morrison turned him into something special, after decades of just being, you know, the guy in the in the back of the panel, uh, everyone wanted a, a shot at the character. But instead of, I mean, there used to be a gentleman's agreement, uh, and yes, that's sexist, but that's the way it used to be because very few women ever wrote comic books in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, and when you took over somebody's book, you took over a book. When you were done with your run, it was like using somebody else's uh, kitchen. You left it the way you found it. You could tell whatever story, make whatever changes, but when you left the book, you left the status quo intact, you know, the, the general skeleton uh, uh, of the characters involved, uh, so that the next guy who takes over can do their take. But that kind of went bye-bye in the 90s and 2000s. And so now you have Animal Man that's been retconned so many times, I'm not even sure the character knows what the fuck his name is. It's, it's kind of silly. I, 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 really, I really miss the Grant Morrison, Peter Milligan, and some ways Tim Veitch, but not really. Uh, I miss that Animal Man. Because it seems like people, it seems like especially... With what you're saying with DC, the word dark, that in terms of storytelling, has changed. It went from something that was put to, that could be really intelligent, like with what we're getting from Vertigo, mm-hmm. and it's become the 13-year-old kid's version of dark, where it's grim, dark, uber-violent, look how intense this is. And the companies, like, it's like DC, are marketing towards that. And only now, the funny thing is, like, they realize, it seems like they realized New 52 was a bad idea. It was a really... Like, they had some good books, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, that marketing was a really bad idea. And now they're rebooting again. Yet it seems like with the DC movies from Warner Brothers, they're doing what New 52 was doing. And they're not learning from how pissed people were with a lot of the stuff that happened in New 52. It, it's kind of like my dating life. <laughs> Where for a while, you know... 
you start dating the, 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 the woman who's like, you know, really attractive and a little bit crazy and very enticing. And then you get in a relationship and you realize she's not a little bit crazy. She's batshit crazy. And, and, and she's going over the cliff and she's grabbing you at the ankles. So now DC, New 52 with DC was that girlfriend. And what DC couldn't figure out was how to break up with that girlfriend. <laughs> they were in it too deep. And if they cut it off as soon as they realized what a bad idea it was, it would have made them look bad. So they let it go on a little bit too long. And now they're, now they're doing rebirth or whatever the hell you want to call it now. It's a reboot. It's not a reboot. You know what it is? It's not New 52. And that's all they care about. Yep. But what are they doing? It looks like they're going back and they're dating that same girlfriend's roommate now, who's just as crazy, if not crazier. The sad thing is I really liked what Morrison had done with Multiverse, and now it seems like they're just ignoring that because they want to line up with movies. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm so happy that Morrison basically was given heavy metal. So we're going to see what happens when Grant Morrison runs, in his, runs his own comic book company, and it's going to be glorious. I, I hope it's glorious, but you know something? In this business, I've seen the Peter Principle in play more often than not. You know what the Peter Principle is, right? Uh, no. What's Peter Principle? Peter Principle was a book in uh, the late 70s, early 80s by a, a writer named Dr. Lawrence J. Peter. And, and the Peter Principle is simply that in corporate America, you are promoted to your highest level of incompetence. And then you're left there to languish. In comics, it would be... So-and-so is a really good assistant editor. Let's make him an editor. He's a really good editor. Let's give him a shot at writing. Oh, he's a really good writer. Uh, let's give him a group of books. Okay, great. He's a, he's a really good – he does well with this group of books. Okay, let's give him uh, – let's make him editor-in-chief. Oh, my God. He is the worst editor-in-chief on the planet. What the hell were we thinking? You're promoted to your highest level of incompetence, and then you're left there to languish because once you're – at a, at a VP level or a president level or, 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 or an, a senior editor level, uh, they can't demote you because you have seniority, and they can't promote you because you suck. <laughs> it sounds like we're talking about Joe Casada. <laughs> I ain't going there. I ain't going there. Uh, I don't know enough about that situation, and uh, you know something? Uh, Marvel... I have to look at Marvel uh, in terms of overall output. Uh, they're winning in sales. They're winning in film. Uh, they're doing pretty good in TV, too. Uh, psh, you know, Joe Quesada is the chief creative officer of Marvel. You can't argue with results. That's true. But like, at the same time, for me, I, I – like, when he started out, and I think it was having someone like Bill Jameis there, too. When he started out, things were it seemed like things were going just up. Like, we went from really X-Men mean ads, absolute bottom, to Grant Morrison, Joe Casey, who only, unfortunately, was on there briefly, um, being, like, the heads of the X-Men books. And people like Axel Alonso, who, despite controversy, I love Axel Alonso. Like, I'm so happy that he's gotten a bigger place in Marvel now. And uh, something? Jem has brought a different, uh, a different thought process got to remember where Jemis came from. You know, you know what Jemis did before? Hmm. He was a marketing guy with the NBA. I would never connect that. That's so crazy. Well, sports franchises, uh, and, and I've done some work recently with sports franchises, uh, some consulting work, uh, and there's a different marketing mentality there uh, because you're, you're literally managing a brand. And I think what Jemis brought into it uh, when you know, before Bill Jemis, it was a publishing company, and you had a bunch of titles, and the titles that were good sold well, the titles that weren't good didn't sell well, and you canceled them, and then you put new ones in, and if the X books are selling good, then make another X book. Oh, the two X books are selling good, make a third one, and then you make enough of them until okay, well the sixth one didn't sell well, so we'll just go back to the five. And what Jemis brought in was that sensibility of Marvel is a brand. So let's manage it like a brand. Let's see some connectivity between the books, going back to the old Stanley, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko days, where the books were more interconnected. 
but he said let's make it let's make some let's set some standards and you saw the trade dresses starting to fall into line the uh the coloring quality started falling into a certain uniformity and you started to understand you know that he wanted marvel to be a brand where you could recognize you know the difference you know what's the difference between a marvel and a dc book well with the interchangeability of all of these different creators how do you do that bill jemison was one of the first guys to introduce exclusive contracts okay george perez we love you we love your work we know you're a freelancer but we're going to pay you extra and make you exclusive to us. And the artists and the writers are like, okay, that's cool. I get paid extra for doing nothing except not working for the other guys. Okay, I could live with that. That that was kind of the beginning of that because look what happened. Like the thing that no one ever expected, Andy and Adam Kubert signing on later to DC. Yeah. Well, you know, back back in the day, when, when Jack Kirby left Marvel to go to D.C., he didn't sign an exclusive contract. Everybody knew he was pissed off at Stan, and there was no way he was going back to Marvel. Yeah. Until D.C. treated him like, a, like, like shit, and he's like, you know, maybe Stan wasn't so bad. <laughs> and like four years later, he's back at Marvel. So I, I think Jemis came in and said, let's make our brand. If our creators are our backbone, let's make the creators part of that brand so that when people know, well, well great, you know, so-and-so works at Marvel. George Perez is, is a Marvel guy uh, and, and, and so on and so forth with all the different creators that he, he signed to exclusives. So uh, I, I think that you know, we, DC's brand has been tarnished because they can't seem to figure out uh, – what to do with these characters, and and uh, I think Didio is is out. Of, I think he was out of his league in the beginning, uh, but the industry is far more complex now than even when he started. I don't think he knows what he's doing. I honestly don't believe he knows what he's doing. I think he thinks he knows what he's doing, but the marketplace is is telling him no, not so much. And the weird part is they bring somebody without a good reputation, uh, Bob Harris. Who ruined, who, like, I'm just going to, I know it was a combination of people, especially Ron Perelman, but Bob Harris kind of drove the X-Men books into the ground. And it's like, you're bringing this guy on to to to, re, to help reboot your company? Why would you do that? I think, you know, sometimes you hire a veteran, even if he's tarnished, uh, for the clubhouse. You know, because he's got the experience. Um, there's a lot of new talent out, and a lot of the new talent doesn't have experience in managing group books. That's true, actually. And I'll tell you something. As a former magazine editor, I can tell you that just managing freelance talent uh, is enough to drive you to drink. It really is, because you have deals with advertisers, you have deals with distributors, you have deals with retailers. The book needs to be there. And that's one of the things that, that I appreciated about CrossGen, not to, not to bring this thing full circle, is the, the promise never to miss a ship date. That was something that everybody there took seriously. And it became a source of pride. And every time you know, a publisher missed a ship date on an important book, we noticed because the fans noticed. And our fans knew that every week, every Wednesday, our books would be in the damn shop. Yep. And I think uh, with CrossGen leaving the industry, that commitment has been lost. Uh, and it's to the industry's detriment. It hurts retailers. It hurts fans. It hurts books. Uh, the, the Films and comics are becoming more and more uh, alike in terms of business units. Yeah. Uh, Superman, uh, or BVS, Batman vs. Superman, opens big. Drops sixty three percent week one, another seventy percent. You know, or, or, I'm sorry. Drops sixty three percent to week two, and then week three completely drops out of first place, and I think it drops like another sixty or seventy percent on top of that. Yeah. And that's the problem that we have with comic books. It, with cross gen, we were launching new titles all the time, and we'd see the drop off. Issue number one, uh, we'd get X number of orders. Issue number two, we'd get 25% fewer. Issue number three, 10% fewer. Issue number four, 10% fewer. And we, it was always, uh, I'd watch those sales figures every, every week. And it was really harrowing to try to figure out 
where's the point of diminished return? Where do you hit that point where it stops dropping? Well, it's like, it's, I remember, well, well, you know, the magazine was definitely uneven in some ways. I remember one of the things I learned from, um, from Wizard was that the issue two would always be the, almost always be the one that was more in demand. Because, you know, there were a billion copies of issue one. It's like one of the biggest comics of all time, of course, is the death of uh, Jean Grey. Yeah. But there were so many printed copies of that that it's actually much harder to find the other issues of the Dark Phoenix Saga. Yeah, exactly. And the reason for that is uh, the pre-orders uh, and the advance orders combined, because, you know, you, you get the pre-orders, uh, the, the, the advance pre-orders, and then the orders, and then sometimes you'd get uh, a, a, little, uh, a little uptick toward the end. And you'd have enough time to increase the print run. Uh, but then when you get a book that you know is in demand, but not in demand enough to justify a second print, well, guess what? Issue number two doesn't get the doesn't get the extra punch. But then what happens is you know so where uh, when you have a book that's late and you're in issue eight and the bleeding is stopped, but issue number nine is a month late. Well, guess what? It's not on the pull list anymore. And now you drop it down even further. When you start missing ship dates, if you have a book, and I don't care how well you're selling, you have a book that misses two or three ship dates in a year, that book's getting canceled before issue 24. Well, look at what's happened with um, Dark Knight 3. Yeah. And it's so aggravating because, like, Miller has, you know, as everyone kind of knows as a writer and as a person, has kind of gone off the rails a bit, to say the least. Well, I have little. I have a little background on that that you don't have because uh, I think you were a fetus uh, when when the, when it came out. When the original Dark Knight came out, Dark Knight Returns came out, the four yeah. miniseries. Um, it was supposed to be you know month one, month two, month three, month four. Well, it was month one, month two, month six, month eight. It took forever for those last two issues to come out. For fucking ever, it was impossible. It just it was it was so ridiculously backed up. It would make Kevin Smith look like a deadline hound. <laughs> Sorry, it's just so funny because for some reason I was thinking about Kevin Smith's Daredevil, the Guardian Devil, and yeah. it's so funny that you bring that up. And uh, and I get it. I mean, I'm also a freelance writer. I write too. Everyone in the comics industry knows me as, as you know one of the the, the uh, publicist or a marketing guy or, or you know an administrative you know, administrative guy at, uh, at CrossGen. I've made my living as a writer the better part of my life. Um, all of the liner notes in the first round of uh, graphic uh, trade paperbacks that uh, CrossGen put out, I wrote them all. Every editorial that you ever saw Mark Alessi wrote, yeah, I wrote those. <laughs> oh wow. So like, every, yeah, it's, I, I just expect you to say like it's and it's really silly, but like you see every 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 kind of angry letter that Kurt Busiek wrote to Marvel in the early eighties and seventies, that was actually me, Tony. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm actually going planning on bringing because he's going to be at out he's going to be in a Phoenix Comic Con. I'm planning on bringing him uh, one of the old X Men ones that he wrote a letter for to get signed. It's fun. I have a lot of those original comics from from the sixties and seventies, yep. and you know, seeing letters from Bill Mantlo in the letters columns in the in the nineteen seventy sixties and seventies comic books from DC. I mean, the, the, there there's some great stuff on the internet out there with different comic book creators who wrote in who who are, who are big time guys now or even retired now. I found one by Bo Smith the other day. It was for like Spectacular Spider Man. And I uploaded to his page, and he actually started talking to me about it. And somebody made a joke and said, "It's a very well formed letter, Mister Smith." Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, but you know, I, I deal with. Uh, I'm a freelance writer myself. I have deadlines I have to make. Yeah. And and it's not always easy because you can't you you can't just turn it on. It's not like a faucet. But the deadline is the deadline. Uh, there, there there's a Facebook thread that uh, I'm having a little fun with. Um, I forget who it was. I think it's Josh Burnham. Uh, uh, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. But 
uh, Maggie Thompson's on it now, and there are a couple of comic book folks on it, and I posted a chart. Let me see if I can find it, because uh, it's uh, it, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Oh, by the way, I know we're I know we're just about getting ready to wrap up the show, but I wanted to I wanted to ask you because this show because I didn't realize how long this was actually running. We're gonna be <laughs> splitting this up into two parts because it's just really entertaining. But um, I would like to invite you back on to talk about different topics because. Yeah, you know, I mean, this became an interview. This was an interview, and it just became us talking talk about different stuff. And I would definitely like to invite you back on if you're interested. Oh, I'm, this is fun for me. Uh, nobody cares what I think anymore, so. <laughs> it's interesting how uh, just being able to, to chat about some of this old stuff. But there's there's plenty of, uh, of wisdom in, in what happened uh, 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 back at CrossGen. Uh, here it is. Uh, first, it was a chart, the writing process. Uh, 80% of it is surfing the Internet. You know, 5% is reading for inspiration. There's a little sliver of typing the word the and deleting it. Uh, bin snacking is a good 15%, and then there's a tiny sliver of actual writing. But then I found another one that Maggie loved. And it's called the creative process, and it's a it's a straight line. At the beginning, it's work begins. Then about seventy percent of the line just has the title "fuck off." Another twenty percent is panic. Five uh, percent is doing all the work while crying, and then finally deadline. I I have seen this, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's that's really I. I think being a freelance writer in comics, being a freelance artist in comics, it's a tough damn job. And they they certainly suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Uh and they hoist these these babies that they birth out of out of their, their minds and their hearts and their and their souls to to fans. And you have a lot of guys that just look at it and say, This sucks. And the creator's thinking, I just spent six months of my life on this damn book. And nobody likes what I did. I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms. We had um, was it Adam Beecham on the show? Mm-hmm. And you know, if you know about Adam Beecham, he had the unfortunate job of writing the, of basically yeah. ruining Cassandra Kane. Yeah. And he didn't want to, at all. Mm-hmm. And we and he didn't. They basically rushed him into the project without letting him do ta- do research. And it ended up really, really, and it ended up damaging his reputation like crazy. And he, he's done a lot of good stuff, especially working on Young Justice, the uh, animated series. And people still know him as the guy who who basically killed off Cassandra Cain, not physically, but in her personality. And well, it, it, sorry. it happens in comics, it happens in movies. Joe yeah. Schumacher is credited with killing the Batman franchise dead, uh, but he, he's directed some really fine films. Yeah. Um, Lost Boys. It's just kind of a silly movie, but it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, the Client. Yep. A John Grisham movie. I mean, he's a good director, uh, but when the studio tells you do it this way, and you're looking at hey, Cat Williams has this great bit because he he was talking about how he hated hosting uh, the uh, the Comedy Central roast uh, for F- Flavor Flav because all the jokes were so racist. And then he says, and then I looked at what they were going to pay me. And uh, I just uh, said, okay, I'll do it. And that's what happens with directors. It happens with comic book writers and comic book artists who are told by an editor or, or a producer or a studio, you have to do it this way. And they look at their bills and they look at the mortgage and they look at the rent and they're like, okay, I'm going to do it that way because I need the fucking check to clear. Yeah. These are professionals. They They do comics because they like them, but they also do comics – because they like things like food and shelter and clothing. I think fans should realize that a little bit more and give and cut some of these guys some slack sometimes. That's something, uh, that's something I learned here. Yeah, you know, like interviewing different comic book creators, you get to actually see them as people. Um, like we do a cosplay show as well, and I was telling you one of the one of the reasons I helped start that show was so people could realize, you know, you can approach these people. 
they're regular people. Sure, they're really wearing the elaborate costumes, and some of them are absolutely stunning, but they're still people, and they want to talk to you. I had to mention cosplay, so I, I wanted to bring up Diana Knight, who was, you know, before cosplay was cosplay, uh, she worked as a model yeah. uh, for, uh, for a lot of DC artists uh, as Wonder Woman. And, uh, oh, the, the Thrill Killer uh, series, I forget who did the, who painted that. I vaguely remember Thrill Killer. DC. It, it, was a, it was a world's finest take, but it was a, a 100% painted book, interiors and exteriors. Uh, but, but she was a model, and when we worked, when we started with, uh, well, the Hero Initiative was called ACTOR before it was Hero Initiative, and ACTOR was an acronym that stood for A Commitment to Our Roots. And uh, she would go to the actor booth in the Wonder Woman outfit and charge five dollars for people to take pictures of you know her with you know in the Wonder Woman outfit. And she's she's Amazonian. She's just I mean six feet plus the heels, and and she looked gorgeous. I just and, I just looked her up, and she really does look like a comic book character, like on and, screen. Uh, she would take every dime and put it in the fishbowl where we were accepting donations. And I literally raised thousands of dollars for us. Would not let us buy her dinner. Would not let us uh, pay for her hotel or her airfare. Uh, although I think at the time she was just driving up from Vegas, so she didn't have you know that many travel costs. But she would not let us do anything to subsidize her costs. She would go there, uh, and she would stand by that booth, and she would make a dime for herself. Uh, the, the, the entire time, and she's she's done that several times, and you know that's the spirit of cosplay. That's the spirit of cosplay. They're wearing the costumes so you can approach them, so you can interact with them, so you can be a part of the uh, uh, of this community. Now, unfortunately, some guys take it too far, and I'm a big supporter of the cosplay is not consent campaign. Same here. We've um, through our page and through my profile, I'm trying to spread as much as I can to help out there. Uh, but you know, Diana Knight was really the spirit that that uh, that I saw the first time I really encountered uh, you know that kind of level of, of cosplay that that that's at a such a high level of of talent and commitment. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I had a I had to kind of look back to that because she was one of the the, the people that really opened my eyes to that. Uh, but she was a class act, and uh, I don't think she does the the cosplay stuff so much anymore. I think she does go to cons from time to time because she's still a fan girl and will always be a fan girl. If anybody sees her, just just say hello and thank her for all the work that she's done to support uh, some of the charities uh, in, in our industry because she is uh, she has a heart the size of Wyoming. I would honestly, from what you've said, I would love to try to bring her on the show. Because we do a, we've done a series for a while. We've had like Ivy Doom Kitty on there, Anna Mia on there, and it would be really cool to try to get her on there as well. She's a sweetheart. You never know. Let me tell you, she knows a lot about comics, a lot about comics, uh, and uh, and she's worked with some of the best artists. But, uh, yeah, I think we should, yeah, uh, I probably kept you way, way over. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a great show, though. This has probably been one of the best interviews we've done because, like, we've kind of recently changed the way our show runs because mm -hmm. we used to be, like, really worried about keeping a for specific format and it started to make things boring. So, uh, recently, like, one of the things we've experimented with is not even having an intro. Like, we had, um, we've had a couple of guests on recently where we just start talking, and that's the show. And we'll, we'll introduce them in the middle of the show, the show, during the show, but, you know, if people see the title page, they know who the person is. Well, something that you might want to try is uh, going to Twitter Blab and doing it uh, uh, with the, the, the screens, because you can get as many as four people on a Blab chat on Twitter, record that, and use that as your podcast. That's a great idea. I've done a couple of political shows. I have a friend who's a political uh, uh, political consultant in Washington D.C. Madison Page. Uh, she is part of the Go Left America uh, chain, 
uh, and uh, she also is uh, the president of Bold Blue Media. So we did a, a series of three podcasts as an experiment that we called Shit Face the Nation. We talked about politics and current events as we were getting hammered. Well, that just makes it better. Um, I mean, having my friend Ian Butcher do a do a drunk cast, like literally by drunk cast, I mean he was drunk on rum, and hearing him explain say in Japan, despite the fact that he'd never been to a convention, was possibly one of the greatest things of all time. <laughs> It involved. It, 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 apparently, there are dragons, Highlanders, and um, uh, who's that? Who's the guy who directed Die Hard Two? Uh, Die Hard Two. Rennie Harlan. Rennie Harlan. Yeah. Because yeah. because earlier we had talked about how Rennie Harlan just looks like he just pressed his face against a uh, tanning bed, just as hard as he could. <laughs> and Rennie Harlan ended up becoming part of the show, and so did Luke Besson. Oh. Luke Besson, there you go. You know who's found another life in television? Hmm. Uh, 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 Jean Swark, who uh, uh, he directed the ill-fated Supergirl movie with Helen Slater back in the day. And now he's directing a lot of television. He's directed, uh, uh, I think, some uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., some Flash. Some he, He's really you know, do, doing a lot. I'd like to see if he is going to direct a, an episode of Supergirl for CBS. So it's kind of like, it's like Michael Lehman. Mm-hmm. Because, like, sure, we all love Heathers, but then we see Hudson Hawk. And then you look at his... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you look at what he's done as a director with, like, American Horror Story, Dexter, True Blood, and it's uh, like, you mean Hudson Hawk. Good job, bro. Well, there's an old thing, there's an old saying, and it's a theatrical, uh, uh, a live theater thing. If it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And uh, in working with some of the scripts I'm working with right now, I'm really starting uh, to live that, that axiom uh, because uh, I, I think directors, you know, comic book artists and comic book writers are only as good as the leeway uh, their editors give them with the source material. Yeah. I completely agree because the less if you're if I mean perfect example if you want one of the best DC stories and one of the worst DC stories the one of the best would be 52 because they basically told um, our punching bag Dan DeVito to stay away because Grant Morrison's awesome like that <laughs> and then um, he was like oh the story upsets me like literally apparently he would stop around the offices talk about how terrible 52 was because the editors weren't allowed to touch it and then Countdown was apparently going to be his good story. And then we all know what happened with Countdown. It's yeah. one of the worst comics of all time. Well, I mean, look at the, the history of the DC Universe. Uh, just DC, not Marvel. Yeah. Uh, what are the stories we remember most? Uh, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow? The Killing Joke? Christ of no, Earth. These were all technically Elseworlds stories. They were, quote-unquote what they used to call in the 60s imaginary stories. And that was a great Alan Moore line at the end of uh, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. This, of course, is an imaginary story. Aren't they all? Yeah, perfect example, like one from that most people don't remember, but I love, Superman Birthright. Yeah. Birthright was going to be Elseworlds. And then it's like, wait, you're Mark Wade. We'll just make this canon. Well, the same thing happened with Killing Joke. You know, that was supposed to be outside of continuity, and then it was so well received, suddenly Barbara Gordon's in a wheelchair, and she's Oracle now. Uh, they, 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 they've been taking Elseworlds books and making them canon, but they still haven't caught on to the joke that when you take creators who are inspired and you take off the chains and you release them from the reins of, of continuity – they just write good stories, and then who gives a fuck about the continuity? We'll change the continuity to match the good story. Exactly. And, I mean, there are some people who are really strange about continuity, but it's like storytelling should come first. And it seems like the best, the most successful writers in comics will say that, that storytelling comes before continuity, continuity be damned. It's all story and character. Story and character. That, that is the mantra uh, on just about every movie meeting I've ever taken is about story and character. And you would still be amazed how many people who are professionals in the business get paid to make movies who still haven't caught on to that. 
it's just it's bizarre. Well, with that, did you um, with that as we bring the show to a close, is there any uh, where can people find you to check out you know more of your work, what you do to keep up with you? Because you're definitely you definitely have a place in, in social network, to say the least. Well, I mean, Facebook, uh, I'm off, on and off. Uh, I, I have a news blog that I pay very little attention to called the News Around My Neck uh, uh, .com. Uh, and as far as uh, the, uh, things that are coming up, I actually anticipate making some announcements before the end of the summer uh, with some of the projects that are coming to fruition. So uh, uh, definitely keep an eye out uh, for, for that stuff. But uh, if you want to keep up with me, I'm on Facebook. You know, it's not too many Tony Panaccios on Facebook, so feel free to, to uh, kick over a friend request. Awesome. Um, thank you again for coming on the show. This was absolutely fantastic, and definitely more than I thought it was going to be when we first set up the, when we first set up the interview. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Or is it Ian? I, I, I can't um, Ian. <laughs> and I know what you're doing, you <laughs> trolly bastard. <laughs> With that, with Tony's trolling, we'll bring the newest episode of Circuit 42 to a close. Thank you, everybody, for listening. You all have a fantastic night. You've been listening to Circuit 42, brought to you by Dragon's Lair San Antonio and Gotham News Stand. Join us for our next episode for all things geek. Circuit 42.